Hi Floss Tube, it's Kim aka Spartan Stitcher on Instagram. I'm back again with another weekly cross stitching update. This is your regular cross stitching video if you saw my video that I uploaded yesterday. Um, this is video number 94. Today is the 9th of November 2020 and it is currently snowing outside. So uh, meanwhile down in Louisiana where my horse is, it's so hot he's out of the sun in a stall with the fan blowing on him because Part of the problem is not that hot, but he's got his full winter coat right now, which causes a problem when it's, you know, 70s, 80s and you have a full winter coat on. So I only worked on two pieces this week. Uh, it was a busy week with my daughter, my youngest daughter at home on quarantine, uh, getting ready for the goal setting video that I published yesterday um, and some other things. So I only worked on two pieces, but... I got progress, so that's what counts. First, I worked on Trick or Treat. Um, put this back on the scroll frame, so I have all the black done. And I was starting down here in the corner, uh, trying to get a partial page done for uh, the Wheel of Fortune event in Full Coverage Fanatics. I figured that that partial page, plus with the feathering around it, would be the uh, 3,000 tent stitches I need for the equivalent 1500 stitches for the word autumn, the counting option with 250 stitches per letter. So I got that done in two days, 3000 stitches. And I, I stopped immediately once I hit 3000 because I've, you know, we're getting to the end of the year. And if you watch my goal setting video, I got goals still I need to meet for, uh, 2020. So here's, the whole bottom of trick or treat and there's one tiny little page finish so there's bottoms of pumpkins shaded into the the reds and um you know burgundies because it's the way the the moon is shining on them and the grass not very exciting but it is to me i mean I get to work in lots of other colors besides black. So there's a close up for you. This is 25 count, easy count. So there you go. That meets my goal on trick or treat for 2020. Cross that one off the list. The other piece I've worked on, I really should be getting more progress, more stitches in this per day, but I'm averaging between 280 and 330 stitches on it per day just because other things going on and um, my motivation is not there on it. Like like I said before, a summer ball, I have a hard time finding motivation on it um, even though it's like I absolutely love the design. So I'm trying to finish page three this month right here. And I had all their heads and next, and this painting to do. I have done this week 1600 uh, full cross stitches on it, taking one color and doing it all over. And there we go. The people still look creepy. Some of them are starting to get here now. A little bit of skin, but really no faces. Um, so the painting is coming together nicely. You can see there's, you know, a woman sitting down, a man standing up. Um, there's, there's some, I don't know if that's a child sitting down. Uh, there's a horse here and then someone else is going to be standing there. There is no back stitching in the painting because it is, you know, in the background and you're not going to be looking at it close up. You can tell that this is a nice landscape with people and a horse and, um, so, and my, my gritting won't stay in. So excuse that, but so I've got this left in the painting and look here, this guy's got a bold head that took me a minute to figure out why I was putting skin on the top of his head. Um, and some of their skin is showing up and hair and started working on her dress some more because I had from her bust line up to go and she's almost complete. She's got a, a pink fluffy thing in her hair. So that's coming together. So hopefully by the time you see this next week, I'll have this page finished. Once I finish all the full crosses, I'll do the little bits of back stitching 
um, which is like along their dresses. Their facial features, as you can see, are not very exact. But we'll get that back stitching done. I thought that I would get one word done for uh, Wheel of Fortune for this piece. I'm not sure yet. I'm going to just keep stitching and counting. Um, I was going to use the word pumpkins, which was would have been 2,000 full stitches, but I'm already at 1,600, um, and I still have to do the back stitching. So I'll just keep going. I may switch those stitches to a, um, a smaller, like a smaller word, and then a second word instead of um, doing only one word and then more stitches that I can't count towards a word, if that makes sense. So those are the two pieces I worked on this week. I do have. Um, let's see, plans. I'm going to keep working on a summer ball. I, you know, beginning of the month, I still need to work on Templar, Prophecy by Long Dog, Big Red Ship. And then, so my only full coverage goals after I get the page finish on a summer ball, my only full coverage goals that I have not met yet are one last page on Kindred Spirits by Jody, Jody Bergsma. That'll be next month. And then the, the other goal that I have not met that I pretty much had written off, but you know, I'm going to say, well, I've got time. I can try for it. Star Wars by Mystic Stitch. This is a uh, out of print pattern. I have one page done and my goal for 2020 was two pages. This is a paper chart. I do not have it electronically. So let me show you again where I'm at. So I have page one done. But because I was, uh, I did one of the national parks on here and I already had some of it started and these pages are slightly smaller than a hay page. To finish the national park I did on it, I also started the next page worth of black. So I have a head start on the next page. And this page has less confetti in it than this page right here. So my idea is get the page done on a summer ball get my non-full coverage goals for the month done and then start attacking this and see between the rest of this month and December with the page on Kindred Spirits if I can get the second page done. It is slower because it is paper chart. So we shall see if I can meet my goal. Because as you know from yesterday's video, if you don't meet your goal one year, it can have tumbling effects into uh, following years. Now, uh, I do have one piece of haul and one piece of stitching show and tell. So we still have stitching content. Don't leave me yet. I ordered two needle minders from Crafty Emily. She has a floss tube channel and an Etsy shop. Uh, she's, as, as her uh, channel says, she's very crafty. She likes doing lots of, lots of little things, not just stitching. She uh, knits and crochets and uh, doesn't like letting things go to waste but she's also very creative so um i got this uh british stamp that she made into a needle minder that's also it's the hogwarts express guys and it's let's see what does it say uh, it's a first class so i don't know what the what the denomination of money is for a first class british stamp but there you go. It's a Hogwarts Express. She has resined over it, so it's nice and smooth. And the backs of her minders are pretty cute. And then this one she made with, uh, I believe it's called Fema. She's got a little dragon eye. And she's got these in different colors in her shop. So I will link below her floss tube channel again and her Etsy shop. And there again, there's the back. It's uh, got some resin on it too, so it's like a button. And so the, she shipped these from the UK. Her needle minders, the cost of them includes shipping. So something to keep in mind when you're looking at the, the cost of reminders. Um, so I'm very pleased with those, and I will keep an eye on her shop for when she puts new things in there. The other thing, stitching show and tell, this is not something I bought. Somebody uh, contacted me and asked if uh, they could send these to me to get my uh, opinion on um, what I think about them, if there's any way to improve them. These are Project Tracker cards. 
uh, by Sylvia Ward Designs or S. Ward Designs on Etsy. I will link her shop below. She said she had, uh, she sent these out to a few different floss tubers to get their opinions on them. And I think they're fabulous. The only um, criticism I had, it's not really a criticism, is just maybe offer these in different sizes because she currently only has them in one size. Um, and I said maybe just offer them in different sizes for w whatever size notebook or planners people have. Um, but the, the size they currently are is still a good size. I just don't know if, um, I don't know what the size is called. It looks like it would fit like a, a mini happy planner, but also, um, I have this, it's a three ring binder, but it's like a half sheet. Cause I think these are half sheet size. Like a, you take a full eight and a half and by 11 card sock and you cut it in half. Um, this is a cookbook that my mom put together of our family recipes after my original was lost in a move. Uh, thanks military movers. But this is like a three ring binder, but it's like half the normal size and it's got, um, dividers and regular size sheets of paper. I don't know where she found it. These dividers are Avery brand. Um, and the notebook itself is Avery brand, but there's no size on it. So, but you must be able to find it somewhere. But it is a regular three ring binder and she even has pro pocket protectors. So if you can find something like this, it would work great if you don't have like a, a mini happy planner to work with these project cards. So here's what they look like. And there's different layouts here for me to show you. So project name, designer, fabric, any notes that you have, start date, uh, finish date, your number of days. And this one is, is for your BAPS. So there's five years on here because it's printed front and back. And if you can see, so she's got the year with a row per month. The grayed out days are your, your weekends. So you can mark on here using um, highlighter, color pencil, color pen. You can highlight or just mark away on here which days you work on your pieces. And I said it's five years, so it's got all five years, 2021 through 2025. So that's her, her uh, five-year cards for BAPS. Here's a project tracker, uh, number of hours per month. So let's see, get my face out of there. Project name, designer, fabric, notes, start date, finish date, number of hours. And then, all right, so here's a different layout. 2020 number of hours. So per month, you can circle or mark your number of hours going across. And then you can keep track cumulative hours down here um, with prior balance. And then, so this layout only has two years on there. 2020 and 2021. She'll probably update her layout to have 2021 and 2022. Um, and then this says list of floss or conversions, any other notes that you want to write on the bottom. Um, so you can track your hours on that. She did not ask me to show these in my, in my video. She was only asking for feedback, um, but I think they're great and I think it would help a lot of people. So I decided to show them in my video. Uh, here's another one. Another different layout. Uh, so the, the calendar is in a different layout. Instead of a month going all the way across, you have your regular month layout. And this is a, a three year card. So you have three years on it. Again, she'll probably update this because 2020 is here on the front. Um, so she, you could have 2021 through 2023 on there. Uh, let's see, that's the same. Yep. Okay. So she sent me three different layouts. So you have the, the BAP tracker, the hours tracker, and then the one I just showed you. So, and these are, you can hear the, they're cardstock. They're going to last a while. They're not, you know, like your, your paper that's going to wear and tear over the years, especially if you want your, your BAP tracker to last five years. So again, I will link that below, uh, if I can get up close to her, 
So that's the name of the Etsy shop, S Ward Designs. But again, I'll link that below if you're interested in some uh, tracking cards for your goal setting and tracking uh, because, you know, we're all getting nerdy like that and because it makes you feel good when you get stuff done. Anyways, let's see. Okay, that is it for my stitching content. If you're not interested in life updates or an Air Force story, we'll see you later. Thank you for joining us and have a good stitching week. Uh, life update. My youngest daughter, her quarantine is almost over. Uh, today is the second to last day. She still has zero symptoms. So as of tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, we should get a phone call from the base public health asking how it's going. And then they'll release her from quarantine. Um, I kept telling her and saying on here that she'd be able to go to school again on Wednesday, forgetting that Wednesday is Veterans Day and there's, you know, as a federal holiday, there's, um, my husband doesn't have to work and it's one of the federal holidays that they don't have school. So they get a day off in the middle of the week. Um, so come Thursday, she'll be getting on the bus for the first time and she's very excited for that. Um, <clears throat> but because we have that day off in the middle of the week and my husband's birthday is this week, he just decided to take leave for the other, for Thursday and Friday. Um, so... I get rid of my youngest daughter and then my husband will be at home. Um, so I'm not sure what my stitching will look like this week. He's been putting together another one of those little Star Wars metal model kits. Um, so he'll be working on those. And, um, you know, we're, uh, we can't go out to eat at restaurants, but we might order some, some food and get, uh, pick up and, and bring home to eat for his birthday. Okay. Air Force story. Three weeks ago, I told you a um, story back in 1983 of an F-15 that flew without a wing after a mid-air collision. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you a story about a B-52 that's flying without a tail fin, or the vertical stabilizer, if you will. So, we are going back to January 1964. The Air Force loaned a uh, B-52H model which is the, the model we are still flying right now. So these are 1960 and 61 uh, airplanes. So they loaned this jet to Boeing to have um, some tests done on it. Back, let's see, a, exactly a year previous, a B-52C model crashed after losing its vertical stabilizer um, due to wind buffeting. And actually three days after the day that I'm going to talk about, a B-52D model also lost its vertical uh, fin and crashed and, you know, people died. Not everybody, but a, a good majority of the crew on both of those airplanes died. So we're now talking about the, um, was it the D model or the H model? No, it's the H model. The H model they tested on this day in January 1964. So it was a Boeing four-man team. So you have uh, three pilots, or rather an instructor pilot, two pilots, and a navigator flying on this jet that had extra instruments added to it to measure the stresses on different parts of the airplane. Uh, and so they were testing the buffeting and the turbulence, especially in low-level flight. So what they did is they took off from uh, Boeing in Wichita, Kansas, and they were flying a certain route. Um, as they headed west towards the Rockies, they were flying about 500 feet on autopilot, going about 280 to 400 knots. And um, they, they finished that portion and then turned north to fly um, parallel with the Rockies. And um, they, they went up a little bit in altitude because, you know, they're right next to the mountains. So they were about 1,000 feet and had all of a sudden heavy gusts and turbulence, like with explosive... Um, wind gusts for a few seconds and the aircraft uh, yawed. Now when I say yaw, that means the, the tail went one way or the other. So the aircraft, aircraft yawed left and then yawed right and started rolling and so, you know, severe turbulence going through that and they had no um, no response to the rudder pedals 
they were in, and they were and the rudder again is on the back end of the vertical stabilizer and they're preparing to bail but as they were preparing they realized they had marginal control so not like everything was responding but they had enough control that they they weren't going to crash immediately and again as this happened they were at 1000 feet so what they did is they uh, raised some of their air brakes, which are, if you um, have flown commercially and you've seen as an aircraft starts to descend towards, um, you know, as it's preparing to land, you'll see little um, flaps going up on the wings. So those are your air brakes. And you can open them up a little bit or a lot. There's different stages you can open them. So they started using some of their air brakes to slow them down. And they started transferring their fuel from different uh, fuel cells in the airplane to transfer it forward to give the aircraft a forward uh, center of gravity. They called for assistance. They called for um, both. They called back to Boeing to let them know what was going on. And they called the ground to, to get a uh, chase airplane up there to kind of, you know, be their eyes and, and see what was going on. Because you had this giant airplane. It's not like an F-15 where you can just turn your head and, and try to see your wing and the aircraft that responded first was a f-100 so we're talking an old fighter jet and he told them that over 80 percent of their vertical stabilizer was gone uh, here i have a black and white photo for you there you go so there's supposed to be a tail there and there's nothing so what they did, talking to the engineers at Boeing, Boeing said, lower your rear landing gear to help um, increase drag down there and provide some stability. And then you can see right there, you see those little pieces of metal being up. Those are the air brakes. So, um, and what they did, since they retained that marginal control of the airplane, they flew at very low airspeed, five hours back. They were going to land in Wichita, but Wichita had weather, so they landed um, in Blytheville, or uh, Blythe, Bly, I can't even say it, Blytheville, uh, Arkansas. Five hours they flew like this with a chase airplane. I think they also had a, a tanker with them as well that responded uh, to, to fly with them. This is aircraft number 610023, and they repaired this airplane, and it flew another 44 years before retiring to the Boneyard uh, at davis Monthan that I've talked about in July of 2008. And due to this incident and the other crashes that I talked about, um, the B52, B-52H inventory was strengthened for that gust turbulence. Now, let's see what else I can show you. I'm going to try to show you a portion of the video because the Air Force always likes to learn from incidents. And they actually had this as a teaching video. Uh, the Chase airplanes took footage and used this as an education, which remained um, not released for many years. But now it is on YouTube. I will link the, the full video below if you want to go watch it. Here I've just started the part where you can actually see the footage of the airplane as it's flying. And I muted the sound. So remember this is 1964 footage so it's not, not so hot. But you can see the rear landing gear is down. And right here and right here those are the air brakes. Trying to give it some assistance as it's um, flying very, very slowly to get back to Arkansas to land. So that uh, vertical stabilizer was completely ripped right off due to the gusts. I read somewhere they, they um, thought the gusts were about 100 miles an hour. So that's like flying during a tornado. So, and it'll continue here for a moment. There's the F-100 that was uh, 
the initial chase plane, so this footage was probably taken from the tanker that flew with them. So the F-100 and the B-52. Let me see if I can skip to... Here it is, about to land. So again, flying really slow. It started to um, be a, come a little unstable, so they just went ahead and, and put it down and still used the drogue chute. I mentioned this before, all B-52s land with a parachute to help them slow down. And there it is on the ground in Arkansas. So that is your Air Force story for the week. I hope everybody has a good stitching week and we'll see you later guys. Bye.